Institute, Gravity Ring and Voyager Station, what kind of materials are you looking to build those with? Yeah, materials we're looking for versus what we're actually using are different. You know, we'd love some uh, ultralight, expandable material that doesn't exist. Um, so for, for Gravity Ring and P-Star, the, the structures are going to be uh, aircraft-grade aluminum. Uh, that, that's basically what they're made out of. And then the uh, you know we'll have solar panels and, and rocket engines and electronics and other things. But the, the structures are, are aluminum for both of those. Do you have any idea how many launches a Voyager station would take to complete with, let's say, Starship? Uh, Voy- Voyager station, yes. Um, I'm not going to reveal that number on this call. <laughs> I think I think, and mainly because it's too soon. Uh, our since we started working on Pioneer Station, we've found a lot of ways to optimize our launch uh, schedule and our our packing in in launch vehicles. And so I, our thoughts on Voyager are shifting. Uh, at one point, we were looking at doing that for about 30 launches, you know, plus or minus. Um, I think we're going to be able to get down to less, but uh, you know, to to be determined. Um, the Gravity Ring project, that's that's a single launch with P-Star. They'll go up together in a one launch vehicle. And then Pioneer Station, uh, you know, we're looking at probably uh, on the order of six or seven launches to have that be completed. But again, that is a floating target. If uh, our plans work out, we might have it done for less. When are you targeting to, targeting to be open for commercial visitors? So commercial visitors, our first paying commercial passengers will be on Pioneer Station, the first Pioneer Station. And our target is to have that operational in 2025. So uh, now the first launches um, might not be tourists. They might be uh, you know, space agency customers. But uh, 2025, 2026, I think the first tourists uh, would would be expected on station. Are you planning on creating an area that would have less gravity or almost like zero gravity? Absolutely. Yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, I think everybody wants to have that microgravity experience, maybe not for a long period of time uh, because you will get sick, (laughs) but uh, at least to experience it, float around, do those somersaults, uh, spin around. So all of our station designs currently have a central docking hub. And that will be a zero gravity station, uh, a portion of the station. So when you first arrive at station, you're coming from your craft, which was in microgravity. You come to the the docking hub, which is microgravity, and then you move out to the gravity portions of the station. And you can always go back. You know, you can spend as much time in that microgravity area as you you see fit, and uh, you have that option, which is which is really exciting. We have got then quite a few other space stations for example the blue origin led orbital reef and then there's axiom space station what do you think about those so i i think i started this interview by talking about the importance of gravity and and the challenges with iss and the other stations being proposed right now are pretty much just a duplication of what international space station is maybe a little bigger with some bigger windows some nicer interior finishes but you're still in a tube that's in microgravity so i think all of that is important there definitely is a use case for microgravity stations especially when um, you're looking at maybe some pharmaceutical applications now we also feel that there's some strong pharmaceutical applications for artificial gravity as well but definitely for microgravity, we know that there's some manufacturing and pharmaceutical applications there. So what I see happening is we're gonna have a, a constellation of stations, not only in LEO, but also you know, in cislunar space and, and even around Mars or you know, uh, going back and forth from Mars. We're gonna have a variety of stations and Pioneer Station, Voyager Station, those are gonna be part of a larger community in a network where you might live on Pioneer Station You go to the orbital reef to work on whatever experiments and manufacturing you're doing, and you come back and you spend the night on Pioneer, right? Um, We don't often, uh, in the United States at least, sleep where we work. And uh, as we start to build up the infrastructure in LEO, I think all these different stations are going to play their role in that larger community. I get the feeling from seeing your designs that this is one of those that when you can spit one out, the second becomes much faster. Absolutely. One of the things we were looking at with International Space Station and why it costs so much to build, right? I mean, when people look at 
building space stations, they always use ISS as a benchmark for cost, which which is fair. It's the only you know large space station on orbit, but it was built. Uh, you know, it was launched with space shuttle, which is the most expensive vehicle that we have ever flown to space. You know, I was talking about kind of ten thousand dollars per kilogram. I cut space shuttle out of those numbers. Space shuttle was, you know, significantly more than that. And then also each of those components in ISS, for the most part, was unique, right? Each of the modules was unique and that just drives up cost. So what we, you know, our strategy with our station designs, like I said, it's forward feeding. We're trying to create basically a kit of parts that can then feed into the next station, maybe with some minor modifications, but everything is interchangeable and and feeds forward. So we're going to build Pioneer Station, and that's going to have some modules on it. Maybe at some point we decide, you know, we want to decommission Pioneer Station. Well, all those station components can then roll over into a Voyager class station or, you know, maybe version two of the Voyager class station. There'll, there'll have to be some out, you know, some retrofitting, but it's all interchangeable. So the machinery that we're building to build the stations, once we get that machinery up and running, it can run for many years. Uh, the modules, the truss components, our star platforms, uh, like you said, everything is designed for maximum longevity and getting those economies of scale, uh, not just doing one-offs. Will there be connecting corridors between the habitat modules? Uh, they've seen some other renders of artificial gravity stations. They don't seem to take into account that people do better when we can interact with one another. Yes, to, to, I agree with all those statements. So there's, there's a trade-off between uh, connectivity and privacy, right? So on Pioneer Station, the station architecture uh, is a little different than Voyager. So I'll, I'll just talk about Voyager as kind of like the end goal there. Each of the modules can connect to the one next to it. So you can, like, let's say, you know, I'm a big company or I've got a hotel and I want two or three modules. I can move from one to the other. I can leave the doors open and create a larger space. But then also there's a, an access tube separate from the modules that allows you to traverse the entire station without ever entering a module. So if a company has some proprietary things that are going on or a government agency is doing some testing, and they don't want tourists, you know, walking through their module, they can close that off. So, so it's like a, a public walkway almost. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, you see this sometimes in, in towns where they have like a whole bunch of different stores and all their parking lots are connected. That's not the main way to get from store to store. You would go out to the street. That's the main way, but you can still get together, you know, connect from one store to the next in the parking lot. That's that's kind of the, the, the analogy, I guess. Do you have any safety measures for space debris, do you plan to have powerful enough thrusters to do orbital maneuvers to avoid collisions? Yeah, space debris is one of those things that, um, you know, there's there's the things you know about and there's the things you don't know about. We can track quite a bit of the debris and then there's just a whole lot we can't track. And, uh, you know, some of the actions by... Uh, some of the governments around the world are just making the problem worse <laughs> instead of better, uh, which is really unfortunate. But uh, ISS, you know, has a couple of different strategies to deal with orbital debris. Now, one, like you mentioned, Miko, is active maneuvering. So there's a piece of debris coming in. You can see it coming from a couple orbits away, and that gives you time to to get out of out of the way and, and to avoid it. The the challenging thing are the smaller pieces that aren't trackable that you don't know they're gonna hit you until they're hitting you, right? So the way ISS deals with that is a technology called Whipple shielding. It was developed by an engineer whose last name was Whipple. And it's basically a, a, a number of layers of material, uh, metal, you know, aluminum and Kevlar with air gaps in between them. So when a, a piece of orbital debris impacts that, it fragments, and the energy is dissipated inside of that shield and, and doesn't uh, puncture the pressure vessel. So we're utilizing those same strategies for our stations, a uh, combination of active tracking and maneuvering to get out of the way of debris, and then also uh, you know, Whipple shielding of the sensitive uh, parts of the, of the station. You know, basically anywhere a person is going to be. Another thing we're doing is uh, duplicity. So, you know, you're talking about the truss network on Voyager Station. Each of those trusses is actually a series. I'm, I'm sorry. Each of those the spokes is what you're talking about. The spoke network. Each of those spokes is actually multiple spokes. There's not just one cable there. So if 
if a piece of debris hit a spoke perfectly, we don't have a failure of the entire system. There's redundant uh, spokes to, to pick up that structural load. So, you know, that and that kind of goes all the way through all of our station design, um, duplicity of, of structural members, of critical life support systems, of, you know, power systems, electrical connections, uh, telecommunications, you know, you just go down the list, right? Um, so those, those are the three three main strategies. Uh, avoidance, uh, reducing the damage, and then uh, uh, duplication of, of systems. Now, ideally, you know, in the future, uh, we're going to have a big multinational effort to clean up all that space debris. And there's a lot of companies working on that and ideas for that. And we're big supporters of all that. Um, and of course, we're talking about, you know, operating in low Earth orbit and LEO. As we move to cislunar space or, you know, a Mars orbit, uh, those debris issues don't take precedence. Now you're dealing with radiation shielding, which uh, you get some radiation shielding in LEO, which you don't as you start to move away from the Earth's magnetosphere. So, uh, and we have some ideas for the radiation shielding as well. And we've got, you know, some potential collaborations with some companies that are doing some really interesting things on the radiation shielding front. And actually our circular torus shapes of stations provide some opportunities that you don't get with an architecture like ISS or orbital reef. So there, there's some really cool things that we're experimenting with on the, the radiation shielding front, which I can't talk about yet, but hopefully uh, soon. Yeah, and if people want the latest and greatest, you know, follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, LinkedIn, we're all over the place. And we'll be sure to provide links to your socials in our description of this video as well. So you were talking about low Earth orbit. Do you have any numbers? What would actually be the orbit? Would it be around the 400 kilometer mark where ISS is, or would it be potentially higher? Yeah, we're looking at slightly higher, probably around 500 kilometers. Also, our orbit is going to be different. Our inclination will be different. So we're looking at a, uh, a sun synchronous orbit that would follow the terminator line so you know this people ask us all the time are you able to see the station from earth uh probably not because uh both pioneer and voyager we're going to have right on that sun synchronous orbit terminator line which means that you would potentially see it right at sunrise or sunset but um you know given the way light reflects and stuff you, and the distance from from the observer standpoint you might you might not see it but uh, the nice thing about that is we won't be getting in the way of any astronomy activities, right? Uh, because we're not going to be visible in the night sky. And then we also have continuous solar power. Uh, our solar panels get power uh, almost 24-7. There's periods of eclipses at certain parts of the year because of, you know, the Earth doesn't orbit the sun perfectly. You know, there's, there's some wobble and, and, and movement there. Two questions I'd like to ask. Firstly, we have some younger viewers that watch this channel as well. What would you have to say to younger viewers that watch us who may be interested in working in space in some day? That is a question I get a lot. And my answer today is very different than the answer you probably would have gotten 10 or 20 years ago. You know, 10, 20 years ago, if you wanted to work in space, uh, you'd want to go to college, get a degree in engineering, possibly get a master's or a doctorate, and then try to get a job at NASA or JPL you know, maybe Boeing, but, you know, that's pretty much the path to space. Today, there's companies like ourselves and so many others. You mentioned Rogue Space earlier, uh, Leo Cloud. Um, you know, th there's a bunch of private space companies now that are doing really exciting, innovative stuff in space. And so the path to working in space now really is following your passion. If there's something that you really are passionate about and that you like to do, become an expert in it and, you know, find opportunities. There's, um, you may, you look at SpaceX, they have people who do communication and social media. You know, you've got uh, obviously the engineers and people who are doing the, the really hard stuff, but you got all those other people as well. Uh, for us in the near term, as I mentioned, we're looking for engineers over this next year, but towards the end of next year and going into 2023, we're gonna start looking for, you know, our mission control team who's gonna be handling all the on-orbit operations, communication specialists. At some point, you know, in 2023, going into 2024, we're gonna need all the, the customer support staff and, you know, people who are handling, uh, you know, our, all our payload management and, and tourists and all that. So, and then looking forward to the stations, when we have Pioneer Station, we, we're gonna have crew orbital assembly staff that are on those stations all the time. And so, 
you know, if, if you have a degree in medicine or if you have some technical background where you can help to maintain the station or provide first aid, uh, you know, those would be the kind of people we're looking for. And then you get to Voyager Station. Well, now we've got, you know, people working in the restaurants, people working in hotels, people doing a station maintenance and operation. There's entertainers. You know, there's just so many different professions. Moving out a decade, you know, if you're in elementary school right now and you're looking at, hey, what do I want to do? In a decade, I think we're going to be at a point where pretty much any profession uh, is going to have a presence in space. You know, if you're an accountant, a bookkeeper, if you're, uh, you know, I'm, I'm basically named the profession. There's probably going to be somebody doing that in space. That's awesome. And and my last question, and this is, again, way out there in the future, but it's something I believe that if any station can do right now, it would be orbital assemblies. Have you given much thought to one of your future stations becoming an Earth-Mars cycler? I did throw that out earlier as an option, yes. We, ha we have thought about that. Um, and, and the real benefit for that, uh, I'm, I'm sure, Rich, you, you've thought of the benefit of this, but that's a long time to be in microgravity traveling from here to Mars. Now, there are some really innovative ideas, like in the Martian, if you recall, they had their, their craft had a rotating portion of it, and then also there's another movie coming out, Prometheus, that's being done by Future Dude Entertainment. I think it's coming out next year, year after that. But they, they have a craft traveling from one you know, planet to another, and they're accelerating to the halfway point. They flip around, and then they're decelerating. And those acceleration and deceleration operations provide some gravity. Um, and the big downside of that is you're burning a lot of fuel. <laughs> your propellant, your propellant requirements to go through the roof, right? So having having a station that's rotating and the rotation, once you get it going, there's no you know friction in space, so you just keep rotating. Uh, very low energy option to creating artificial gravity for those long duration trips between Earth and Mars, and then you're just you know you're just taking your starship or whatever craft when it comes around the planet, just take the passengers up, they get off. They're living in a hotel until they get off and they take another you know, trip down. So, yeah, we, we have thought about that. As I mentioned earlier, the radiation issue is one that we're, we're really looking to solve for those interplanetary transits. I'm not sure what SpaceX's solution is for that right now. I think they're thinking people will just survive <laughs> the trip. But if we have a cycler, theoretically, we've got crew that are doing multiple laps you know, between Earth and Mars and being on that platform for an extended period of time, in which case we would definitely want to make sure that they're they're safe and they're not being uh, exposed to too much radiation. If I can just add one thing, you know, we're really focused right now, like I said, in that 2023 launch, we're going to be launching P-Star and building Gravity Ring and showing artificial gravity at scale for the first time and really starting to answer some of those long-standing questions. But, you know, we ended there talking about the Cycler Orbital Assembly Corporation. Really, our mission and our goal is to get large numbers of people living, working, and thriving in space. And so, you know, Voyager Station, while that's a flagship project, that's not the end goal. That's a stepping stone to bigger, larger things, you know, moon bases, settlements on Mars, stations throughout the solar system, creating large economies and communities in space. And that's what we're passionate about. Baby steps right now, but uh, there's, there's some great stuff ahead, not just with our company, but just space in general. Thank you, Tim, for being with us today on, on this episode. It's been real great having you here. Uh, it's been fascinating listening to what you've had to say and definitely a lot of things to look forward to from you in the future. As I said before, we will be linking all of Orbital Assembly's corporations' socials in the description of the video below. And with Tim's permission to, uh, the Net Capital link, if that's okay? Absolutely, yes. It's been absolutely awesome talking to you. The whole Orbital Assembly Corporation is very interesting. The projects are awesome. And we'd be happy to talk to you again sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to it.